Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Safe Routes to School webinar on tactical urbanism. Welcome, my name is Diane Hansen, and I am the program director for Massachusetts Safe Routes to School. I am delighted to be your moderator today and to share with you our goals for this session. One is what is tactical urbanism? Uh, number two, how does tactical urbanism relate to safe routes to school? And lastly, how do you plan your own tactical urbanism events? Just a, a, some quick housekeeping. Um, please use the Q&A box to submit your questions. And a recording will be made available for, uh, for this webinar on our mass.gov Safe Routes to School website. It usually does take a few weeks for us to get that up. Uh, we do make the file accessible and caption it prior to putting it up online. Lastly, we do have continuing education credits, which are available, and I'll show you the details on the next page. If you are having a problem with audio, the best option is to have WebEx call you. That means it identifies you with your name in the WebEx window. So uh, please uh, make sure that it, WebEx does call you. Moving on to the credits. AICP members can earn one CM credit for their activity, and more information is available here on their website. If you are running into problems capturing this credit, please email me, and my contact information will be available at the end of the presentation, but email me and I can help sort that out. And now I'd like to preview today's speakers. As I mentioned before, I am Diane Hansen. I'll be your moder moderator for today's WebEx. I will introduce each speaker in advance of their section. So our first speaker is John Dempsey, and he's going to review tactical or what is tactical urbanism. John is a professional landscape architect in Tool Design's Minneapolis office with experience in a wide variety of urban design projects. His past work includes the City of Boston's Bicycle On-Call Design service, Services and the MBTA's High Capacity Bike Parking Project. He brings his passion for active transportation to design practical solutions that make walking and biking safer and more enjoyable activities. He also lends his critical and creative eye in the development of concept graphics and various construction level documents. Welcome, John. Good morning. Thank you, Diane. I'm happy to join the, uh, the conversation this morning. So let's kick it off with uh, a definition of what is tactical urbanism. Uh, it really, really is short-term action for a long-term change. Um, and it does this in a variety of ways. It requires short-term commitment and more realistic expectations. Uh, it really is intended to test the concept to address a need. Uh, really, it offers a low risk and an opportunity for a high reward. Can build momentum and change through uh, various stakeholder engagement activities. Typically, it's best with local ideas and solutions for very context-specific uh, planning changes. Uh, it's really, it should be accessible by all ages and abilities, typically low cost, using relatively um, inexpensive materials. Um, and other efforts such as Complete Streets and Safe Routes to School, uh, this has been implemented with. It kind of blurs the lines between city planning, public art, design, architecture, advocacy, policy, and technology. So it is also uh, known by a variety of other names, uh, which are kind of listed on the screen. Some of the terms like pop-up are better suited to typical smaller scale interventions, where terms like open streets, play streets, usually imply a larger scale demonstration with accompanying event or festival type atmosphere. Tactical urbanism can, uh, can range widely in size like in time frame and purpose. Uh, the photo on the screen is a demonstration project that was about a half a day implementation. Uh, it demonstrates a curb extension that was done as part of a school travel plan process in the state of Georgia. The demonstration was on a single corner in front of the school, and it just lasted in the, uh, the PM dismissal time frame. It was done with materials of chalk, tape, to show how uh, reducing the radii of an intersection could calm traffic and reduce the overall pedestrian crossing distance.
of local note that made some headlines in social media and uh, print is the uh, city of Medford. Um, the Boston Globe featured an article about a small school, school oriented tactical urbanism event, uh, right, in, right, and is the local example. Um, the idea was presented last year by a pair of students, uh, fifth grader Eric, fourth grader Isa, who were concerned about drivers occasionally speeding near the school. Um, there was an incident where uh, Eric's younger brother was almost actually hit by a, uh, a vehicle outside the school. So that really kind of launched the, uh, the, the local children's effort through the Mid Medford Center for Citizen and Social Responsibility, uh, which is an after-school program that supports student-led projects to improve their community. Uh, they pitched their idea to highest levels of City Hall and won over local leaders, and voila, they had a uh, tactical urbanism 3D printed crosswalk right in front of their school. At the other end of the spectrum, our full day or month long tactical, tactical urbanism, urbanism demonstrations. Uh, the map you're viewing on the screen is from the Open Streets County Howard event. Several different uh, infrastructure demonstrations were set up a roughly um, 1.5 mile loop. And you can see there are a dozen of vendors and other activities that were, uh, that were on board and involved as part of the process. These events were sponsored by a local health foundation to promote physical activity and generate popular and political support to increase funding for uh, future bicycle and pedestrian facilities within the county. Uh, as an example, Portland, Oregon, the Better uh, NATO Project sets up a temporary bicycle and pedestrian facility for several weeks each summer to better accommodate active transportation users accessing the many festivals and events at Tom McCall Waterfront Park. The project was initially led by uh, Team Better Block PDX volunteers in 2015. Uh, it really proved so successful at reducing conflicts and providing access to uh, that Portland City Council voted to kind of make it an official program under the Portland Bureau of Transportation. So this, this X gets the greater question of why. Um, and I love this illustration, but not done by a colleague of mine, uh, Ian Lockwood. It's really time to rethink the definition uh, of the capacity of a street. Everyone involved with Safe Routes to School is aware of changes in school travel pa patterns over time, the negative health and environmental impacts of motor vehicles that result when streets, towns, and cities are designed and planned for cars. Tactical urbanism about reclaiming space for people in the public right away and really rethinking and making it more safe for, and more appealing to people uh, walking and biking and taking transit options. So specifically, um, I've been inspired by uh, Jan Gale. He is not the, uh, the grandfather of tactical urbanism. However, he did rethink uh, the way people approach and use space. And I really think uh, he's, um, he's on board and applies some of his um, thinking and thought process through, uh, through a tactical urbanism lens. So how does tactical urbanism relate to Safe Routes to School, you're probably wondering. Specifically, um, you know, I think tactical urbanism is a great fit for Safe Routes to School because it hits on all the six E's, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Um, engineering, obviously, is the, is the most apparent since you're making changes to the physical environment but uh, these, also, these changes are also educate all road users and encourage more walking and biking. The right designs can enforce desired behaviors and no tactical urbanism demonstration is complete <clears throat> without pre and post evaluation. Tactical urbanism can also address equity concerns from mode imbalances to creating safer conditions in neighborhoods and legacies of disinvestment. Materials are typically inexpensive and proof of concept to help move move the needle and gain support for these longer term changes. Uh, the next few slides, I'm gonna take a look at a few of the Safe Routes to School tactical urbanism projects that I have been specifically involved with. So the two examples I'm gonna uh, walk through are from the state of Georgia as part of the uh, Safe Routes to School uh, program there. The first example is North Mitchell Elementary School. It's a small scale, short demonstration project um, completed as part of the travel planning process. Uh, the elementary school is located approximately one mile from where students live in the small rural town of Baconton, Georgia. 
The school is specifically located on a two-lane rural highway separated from the town by a, a four-way divided highway. So uh, relatively high rates of speed um, generally occur when motor vehicles on these roadways. There are no pedestrian or bike facilities to connect the town to the school. Thus, most students are arriving by bus or personal family vehicle. And it's really the lack of safe, safe route between the school and the town means that kids, if they miss the bus, there's no one available to give them the ride, then uh, they take an absent for the day. So the goal of this demonstration project was to really uh, demonstrate uh, the concept of what a multi-use trail along a road might look like and, and kind of generate buy-in among stakeholders to include this as a formal recommendation as part of the school travel plan. Since this demonstration was installed uh, specifically on the school property, uh, minimal advanced coordination um, was, was a part of this process because it, we were specifically coordinating with uh, local stakeholders at the school. The, uh, the driveway you see is primarily used by school buses and trucks uh, delivering to the cafeteria in the rear of the school. So this was a much lower volume uh, driveway as opposed to the pick up and, dri pick up and drop off driveway that is uh, just north of this one. So with, uh, with some inexpensive white duct tape, uh, we were able to simulate what a, uh, a, a typical crosswalk marking would look like. Um, and we, we, we scaled it out using a measuring wheel and spaced it off to, make, to really demonstrate and replicate uh, what a, a typical or standard G dot crosswalk would look like. Roughly start to finish, it took about 90 minutes um, and the duct tape uh, really, really works wonders and holds in place. We also wanted to illustrate how the trail might be connected to the crosswalk. So we used uh, some thin rope that we obtained from a hardware store to kind of demarcate the boundaries and the general alignment of the trail. Um, all in, we purchased the materials at a local hardware store for um, approximately $40. I think some of the uh, creativity that comes with the tactical urbanism events as well, it adds value to it. Um, we, we added a, a customized wayfinding sign that really uh, helped try to showcase the, um, the mascot and make it uh, just kind of be more uh, be collaborative and be part of the school and have, um, provide a little bit more ownership as part of the project. So the, uh, the outcomes, the demonstration was shown to stakeholders, it really as part of the school travel plan meeting. When asked uh, if the demonstration project should be removed after the meeting, uh, they really wanted to keep it up and um, have it up for a few days after that too, just to allow more, uh, more stakeholders, more of the community to kind of see what the potential and the possibilities um, of that crosswalk and trail could be. The, the recommendation for the Shady East Path was officially adopted in the school travel plan and uh, really sets, uh, sets, the, sets the bar high to be a part of the uh, future infrastructure grants. And the, uh, there's a photo rendering in, on the slide now to generally show the alignments of what it could potentially look like. The, the second site I'm gonna talk, uh, discuss is uh, Jeff Davis Elementary School. This is in Hazelhurst, Georgia. The school is located in a small town, has a high number of significant students arriving by family vehicle. Um, since this is more of a rural context, there's no curb and gutter along the roadway. Thus, uh, a lot of personal vehicles are driving and parking um, on the shoulders and the grass buffers. So we, when we do a school travel plan, we definitely arrive and observe arrival and dismissal procedures. Uh, the, there are some issues that we, uh, we observed right off the bat. Formal procedure is shown on the orange arrows uh, on the Pat Dixon Road, you can see. However, parents that didn't want to wait in the car queue using, were using the parking lot to the north to drop off and kind of bypass the, uh, the Q lanes, that's demarcated by the, the red arrows north of Pat Dixon Road. Uh, this created numerous potential conflicts with the, uh, you can see the mid-block crossing, right where the red circle is, and that is where also where the crossing guard is placed. 
This next slide breaks down uh, the thought process behind the proposed tactical urbanism demonstration. The key issue to be resolved through the, <clears throat> through the demonstration was reducing the number of conflicts at the, at the mid-block crosswalk. To do this, the demonstration would formalize the use of the north parking lot for student drop-off and the westbound traffic demarcated by the, uh, the or yellow arrows. Eastbound traffic will continue to use the south parking lot next to the school. Uh, the circulation pattern greatly reduced the number of vehicles traveling uh, through the mid-block crosswalk. John, you just had some animation, and so that popped up. Okay. Thanks. For the team working on the demonstration, their next step was to think through the signage that they would need to communicate these new traffic patterns. If the demonstration uh, proved successful, they would really need to implement these signs uh, as, as permanent and part of this uh, in tactical urbanism event. So this last diagram outlines the actual arrival and uh, pop-up event. The last diagram here just shows how the parking lots and roadway would be set up for the demonstration event. Note, this was really rudimentary using uh, Microsoft PowerPoint and adding uh, shapes over a, just a generic Google map, so no high-end uh, software needed. The or orange triangles, traffic cones, and they're used ripe and other materials to help direct pedestrians to the crosswalk and with assistance of the crossing guard. Uh, and the signs were also made as part of this demonstration event. You can see here we used a uh, large-scale uh, printer, but no need to do a, a full a full size plot um, if you're not if you don't have that readily available. This can be uh, hand drawn on poster board or any kind of combination of large paper. And um, I think it's really advantageous too if you can even have the students be involved as part of the process as well. It makes give them a better sense of ownership. After the signs were printed. We mailed them back to the school where they're affixed to cardboard and handles. After conducting outreach to the school community, the school is ready for the event and uh, all hands on deck recruited volunteers to hold and sign direct traffic. Uh, a very important point too, note that any volunteers you use for events should be briefed and given uh, proper instruction of the purpose of the event and why this is important. In addition to helping set up and take down the event, uh, really, the volunteers are a critical glue, a part of the education component as well. Uh, and I just love this photo. This is uh, the actual uh, crossing, the day of the event. You can see it's calm, well-managed mid-block crossing, and uh, everyone is, is smiling and walking to school. So some of the outcomes from our tactical urbanism events. Uh, really, demonstration and school travel planning process resulted in, in uh, additional recommendations to calm traffic near the school. The two photos on their screen are, were part of a, uh, two roundabouts that were completed in the summer of 2018. While not directly related to our tactical urbanism event, they do, studies have shown they do help uh, calm traffic and permit more, uh, more appropriate behavior um, in, the, uh, in the environment. And I'll pass it to the next speaker. Thanks, John. I'd now like to introduce Sarah Brown. Sarah holds her bachelor's degree in civil engineering and professional writing from Worcester Polytechnic Institute here in Massachusetts. For her undergraduate capstone project, Sarah implemented and evaluated a low cost <laughs> traffic calming measure in an elementary school zone to redistribute the power between motorists pedestrians, and cyclists. She believes school zones are a logical starting point for innovative infrastructure to change driver behavior and enhance pedestrian safety. Sarah is currently working as a research assistant at the University of North Carolina Highway Safety Research Center. She primarily works with the Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center and provides technical assistance to related safety research efforts. 
Sarah will be pursuing her Master's of City and Regional Planning at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in the fall of 2019. We are so pleased to have Sarah talk about her work with one of our Safe Routes to School partners here in Worcester. Welcome, Sarah. Hi, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I'm very excited to be on the webinar and talking about my senior design project and the role that tactical urbanism plays in Safe Routes to School. Um, Safe Routes to School and tactical urbanism are a great combination because of the opportunities to educate, encourage, and empower at the community level. Schools also serve as ideal starting points for these changes because improving safety where youth walk and bike supports safety for everyone. The goal of tactical urbanism projects are to create an open and intentional development process that invites new stakeholders to the table. And we can begin to actively think about the system and all of the different professions that are involved in making a resilient community. For this project, I was working with the Maine South Community Development Center in Worcester, Massachusetts, and I was asked to work on Safe Routes to School because of ongoing student safety initiatives in the community, and I had the freedom to do more with it. Um, here are some pictures from the school zone of Woodland Academy, which is an elementary school in the Maine South neighborhood of Worcester, Massachusetts. All the students that attend the school live within a mile radius and must walk or bike or be dropped off at school. And as you can see, there are wide travel lanes, lack of curvature in the road, lack of buffers separating the street from the sidewalk, all things that support motorists feeling comfortable driving fast. Woodland Street, where the front entrance to the school is, ranges from 34 to 42 feet wide in some places. The goal of this project was to improve safety for students at Woodland Academy. Uh, a traffic calming measure was implemented and evaluated in the school zone through a temporary demonstration for about two weeks, and recommendations were also provided to improve the future data collection, coordination, and implementation of tactical urbanism efforts at other schools in Worcester. This is a map that I used to document the data that I collected during the early stages of my project. It's a compilation of my observations on site, stakeholder interviews, and a small workshop that I held with Woodland Academy staff. Through this map, I could communicate what was happening in the neighborhood in a very transparent way. Being able to relay your story to a wide variety of stakeholders, especially people that do not come from design backgrounds, is an essential piece. This map shows the current arrival and dismissal operations, observed drop-off locations, and positive and negative observed behaviors. Um, some examples including motorists backing up, U-turning, not giving students the right-of-way in the cross crosswalk. But there are also good things that were observed, such as crossing guards out, every arrival and dismissal, helping students get to and from school safely. My second objective was deciding where I wanted to do my demonstration project. An area in the school zone was chosen following the analysis of past collected data, my observations, and all of the interviews with stakeholders. And I did struggle with how to approach prioritizing, but I found that taking a step back and reminding myself of the story and the bigger picture and the bigger system of what's going on ultimately led to my decision. My choice is based on proximity to the entrance of the school, the high amount of dangerous observed behaviors, a way to build on the positive arrival and dismissal operations, and having an amazing crossing guard and a true community champion who took ownership of this project. Oh. I decided to introduce a median design into the school zone. The median creates narrow travel lanes and adds more complexity to the street. We know that one of the most fundamental ways to increase the safety of environments is to reduce the driver's false sense of security and reducing speeds by introducing design elements. It also sends a message to drivers that this street is a shared space, a space for both movement and public life. And also, I had a hunch that it would eliminate a lot of the dangerous motorist behaviors I was seeing just by simply not giving the space to do so anymore. The hope was that it would foster the safety of slow speeds and make the street feel dangerous to drive fast. This is a picture from my project when I implemented it in the end of November 2018. 
A little context, I was working by myself on this project and it took a little over 14 weeks to do all the data collection, analysis, find where I was going to get my materials, and make a plan to go out. To clarify my process a little bit, I did ask the City of Worcester DPW if I could do my project. I basically said, hi, I'm an engineering student, can I try something? And they said yes, and that was that, so I would never be afraid to ask. The materials I used were cones and blockades that I borrowed from, my, from WPI, and I made this sign out of cardboard and paint, and the lines that you see were drawn by my friend with temporary paint with a line striper that he had bought. For the demonstration, I woke up and got to the school around 6.30 a.m. to help the crossing guard set up the first morning. And then the next morning, I got there, same time, and he had already set it up himself. And then I stopped going because you trust people who care about their communities. And I left the materials there to be used for two weeks by the school. Within Street functions as a one-way during arrival, so we did experiment with a drop-off lane in a through traffic lane, and then that sign was taken down and the median stayed up all day in the road when Woodland again functioned as a two-way. Um, many things were observed during this demonstration project. Um, a lot of dangerous behaviors went away, people were slowing down with the codes in the road. But also, a long queue of cars was formed during arrival and really brought to light how many students are being dropped off at school in this neighborhood, considering all the children that attend live within a mile radius. And design is just one part of this system, and it's important to bring in the other E's that safe routes to school values. I made a final report with all my data and included a toolkit that I gave to the Maine South Community Development Center that talked through my exact steps, what programs I used to make my baseline map, um, the prompt lists I was using when I was walking through the neighborhood and what I was looking for, and ideas for who could continue, to the, could continue the movement forward in Worcester. I learned a lot through trial and error and handed all of my lessons learned over in hopes of continuing the momentum. An update from the school, Woodland Academy still works hard and implements the design the best that they can every day. I was not able to donate the materials that I borrowed from my school, but my family ended up buying materials and donating just to keep it going and to continue to raise awareness and questions about these types of community initiatives. I got a lot of positive feedback from both faculty and parents, and the community is very supportive and open to change when it's brought to them. When we have foundations like this, we need to continue to work to create safe communities that we need right now, and hopefully continuing to highlight the importance of these types of projects, continuing to probe uncertainty in light of not knowing all of the answers, and teaching elements of design and safe systems to new stakeholders and communities will imbue more conversations and projects. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sarah. That was wonderful. And I just wanted to uh, let the audience know we are getting a few people that said that their audio is going in and out, but I think overall we're still, um, our audio is fine, so it just may be an uh, internet connection. We will have the presentation available uh, for on online in a few weeks, so uh, if you missed anything, be sure to come back and uh, view the webinar. I am now going to introduce Mark Chase from NeighborWays. Mark is the founder and principal at Neighborways Design. He has over 20 years of transportation planning experience in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. As a social entrepreneur, Mark helped launch several enterprises, including the innovative car sharing service Zipcar and social networking carpool site GoLoco. He now leads Neighborways Design, a tactical urban planning and design firm on a mission to rapidly transform our streets. Teaching graduate pedestrian and bicycle planning and urban tra transportation planning at Tufts University since 2008, Mark is a well-known researcher and active transportation activist. Mark's talk today will highlight lessons from the planning and implementation of neighborways in Somerville, Boston, Everett, and Revere. Welcome, Mark. Hi, everyone. Hopefully, I am, I am, I am audible here. Always a little nervous with technology. You. Good, good, good. So um, thank you all for, for uh, inviting me here and great to virtually present to you all. Um, I think you are advancing the slides, is that right? Okay, 
So I'd like to talk a little bit about neighborways, otherwise known as neighborhood greenways, sometimes called bicycle boulevards. Um, what we're trying to do with very low-cost materials is create low-stress networks in the city, and that's ways that kids, kids at heart, dog walkers, joggers, bicyclists can get around um, in, a, in a really calm and relaxed way. But we do this with a lot of community building and creativity and public art. Get the next slide. Um, I'm just going to show you, I don't know how well people know Somerville, Mass, but we have a map here of um, Somerville where the upper left, we have a community path, which is incredibly popular and goes to a subway station. And then the green lines and also the yellow line are um, quiet streets that carry less than 1,000 vehicles a day. And if 1,000 sounds like a strange number, think of it as one or two cars a minute during rush hour. So, so not very busy streets. But what we've done with these streets, next slide, is connect them using paint and signage and other tools so that people who are getting around town can recognize these streets and uh, make their way between schools, parks, and squares. Quickly back to the last map, um, the, 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 the little schools on this, the network connects four schools and a number of parks. So that's how one of the ways that we decided how to pick streets was were, were that they were quiet streets and they also connected places. So going forward two slides, uh, <laughs> we are also installing this year signage. And this is important. It's just another way of helping people to understand how far it is between destinations from where they're standing. And we're using minutes over miles just because People think that way. I actually ran into a high school student, and, and I was talking to him about the network, and he was going, yeah, I, I saved 10 minutes by biking. And, and this kind of shows that in the sign, and that if you walked, it would be 15 minutes, but if you biked, it would be four minutes. Maybe you should dust off the bike and uh, get a little extra sleep. So the next slide um, is very similar to the design I showed earlier where we did it with paint and flex post, but this is in Vancouver, and this is the dream, which is start using paint and flexible posts to um, delineate the street, and then as you get more money, uh, do things like rain gardens and physical barriers. As you can see, this is uh, back to the last slide. This is a, uh, a one-way street for cars, but it's two-way for bikes. And this is really important on these quiet streets because often these streets were made one way to keep cars from using them as cut-throughs. And so by keeping the network open to two-way cycling, you're really allowing people to um, bike on relatively quiet, definitely very safe streets that uh, get them places they want to go and keep them off of the faster, more dangerous arterial streets. So the next slide uh, just shows some of the speed tests that we've been doing. And this is the city, actually. We do our treatments on quiet streets, but the city liked it so much they started doing them on major streets and they're collecting data. And surprisingly, uh, the paint actually does slow people down. Um, the speed test showed, and these were done about a year after the paint was put in, that on one street, 14% fewer cars were exceeding 25, and on another, 39% were. So um, paint does have an impact. We found on the slower streets, it's more of a branding kind of recognize this, that you're on the right street and that you're making your way across the network. But on the, on the bigger streets, it actually has a real traffic calming impact. Next slide. Uh, one thing that we're looking to do a lot of this year is replace our flexible posts with planters. And um, they're beautiful, they're lightweight when they're empty, but when they're full of water, they're extremely heavy. And so uh, the water both 
keeps the plants in business. Uh, you only have to water these planters about every two weeks. But they also form really nice, beautiful barriers on the corners where we're doing painting to narrow the intersection so that it's a shorter crossing distance. And as cars are turning around the corners, they're turning at a sharper angle and therefore a slower speed. Uh, next slide. This is something that we're uh, experimenting with and having great success with, which are uh, flex post neck downs. And the neck down is basically narrowing your street in a, in a little in a spot to slow cars down. And this is a test we do with residents. We come out early in the morning during rush hour and uh, take these posts and just put them in the street. But before we put them in the street, we're actually out measuring speeds of cars. We'll you know, do the first 25 or 50 cars with a handheld radar detector. Then we'll put the posts in and, you know, people are kind of hiding on a porch. We've got one person with a radar detector out of sight measuring speeds and people on the porch are entering data. And if you go to the next slide, um, you can see on the left, the before data, where the top speed was 30 miles an hour and the bottom speed was 15. And then afterwards, you know, the, the after data comes up as people are entering it in and the top speed goes down to 27. The bottom speed is as low as five and the median speed <clears throat> went from 23 to about 17. So the, the really great thing about flex posts are you can calibrate them for the speed you want. So in Canada where they've been doing this for a while, they'll put them on a 40 mile an hour road and the, this, the, the posts will be, you know, maybe 13 or 14 feet apart. But if you want people to go on a 20 mile an hour road, you have them 11 feet apart, which is what we're showing here. Um, you can move them closer together or further apart. Uh, the other important thing is you want to put these posts where they don't um, impede driveway access or parking. And so you're right out there with the residents and you're deciding where to put the posts. When you're done, you take out your can of spray paint, you spray some dots on the street and uh, DPW or your installer comes out and installs them at a later date. So it, it, it includes a community participation, the data gathering, and then the placement all in one um, go, which is, which is really great. Next slide. Um, the dream, it's always like short term, long term, but we're hoping to do a few of these this year. They're not that expensive, which is to replace the flex posts with trees that are physically in the street. And we have a saying with neighborways that no parking is ever harmed in the making of a neighborway. So um, with the street trees, we, we'll take a spot between two driveways where you can't fit two cars or you can't fit three cars. And we'll take that extra half a parking space and either put our flex post to begin with, but once we've proven that that's a good spot for it to go back in and actually physically put a tree in the street and in, in streets where you have narrow sidewalks, this is really great because it's keeping your sidewalk open for people on wheelchairs or being able to walk side by side and putting trees in the street where they are having a, perhaps a larger tree well, certainly the case here in Somerville, and also um, slowing traffic down. So the next slide. This is some trees that were some trees that were planted in Providence almost 20 years ago. So it shows you how these street trees have fared over the years. Um, next slide. Uh, this is an exciting future possibility, which is as people think of their streets in new ways, this is in Vancouver where they actually severed the street and basically put like a park in the middle of the street. So people can, it, it, it turns a through street into two cul-de-sacs basically. So, you know, this is, this is a long-term goal, but it's one that when residents start to think of their street in new ways, they can take back some space and create some really beautiful spaces where perhaps there's a shortage of parks. Next slide. Um, this is also in Vancouver. This shows a neighborhood traffic circle. And these are really just traffic calming devices. They don't have a real, um, I guess, traffic control device. That, I'm, I'm trying to think of they, They're not like a roundabout in that they don't carry a tremendous amount of vehicles, but they do slow cars down and you can landscape the center of them. And it's something that we're hoping to try this year. 
There are a lot of those in Seattle. Um, next slide. So I'm going to pivot now to uh, what we're well known for in the Boston area, and we're certainly hoping to do more of these. We've done about six of them, which is bringing public art um, onto the street. And next slide. What we do is we work with residents, and if you look, there's a YouTube link on the slide, and I think Diane will post this in the comments so that you can look at it. Don't look at it now. Wait until we're done. But uh, this this YouTube video really is a great video talking about the process, which is essentially residents get together. They think about what they'd like in the street. And in this case, the long-term dream is a beautiful Italian fountain. The short term is potentially a street tree in the middle of the street. But they worked with an artist, uh, the residents who lived in the neighborhood, to design the street painting. And then on one day, where we get up around 8 in the morning, start painting, and by 2 in the afternoon it's done, we have a party, by 6 in the afternoon it's really dry, and then there's a beautiful painting. And um, it really changes the way people think about the street. It really creates a sense of the street as a place. People can talk about things that they would like to see in their neighborhood and on their street, and a lot of connections are made. Um, although this usually starts as a traffic calming effort, uh, at the end of it, people, when we talk about the value that they've gotten out of it, the biggest thing is really getting to know all your neighbors. Uh, relationships are formed, people find apartments, connections are made. It's, it's really an amazing process. Next slide. I'll just run through some of the ones we've done. This is a, uh, a street painting that the neighbors really like birds, and so they put up over 40 birdhouses on the street, and then the motif on the street is clouds and birds going across a Persian carpet that is to signify the street as their living room. One really great thing that happened on the street was that before the painting, people had their parties in the backyards in their backyards, but afterwards, a lot of parties moved to the front yard just because they wanted to overlook their street, and um, the kids the kids would play and they'd get to really enjoy the the fruit of their labor. Next slide. This is one that is a labyrinth, and labyrinths are different from mazes in that they're a spiritual walk where you walk into the middle and back out. You don't get lost. Um, there are also a lot of rabbits in the neighborhood, and so they wanted to, to um, pay respect to the rabbits. And this is a, an interesting one because we learned a valuable lesson that we've taken to all of our other murals, which, what, which is make sure you include every single person who can see the mural because one person um, wasn't included in this process and it led to a rather difficult dispute on the street. Um, ultimately, everybody came together, but it was something that we definitely don't want to repeat. And since then, we're really fastidious about making sure that we reach every single person. So it was, it was a good lesson learned on this one. Uh, the mural sits off the center of the street. It's kind of an eddy in the road. So the cars, when they're driving down the street, they're actually driving across the top where the little kid and the scooter is. And that mural is completely out of the way of car traffic, which is really great in terms of wear and tear. And it's something that now as we design our street paintings, we design them so that um, we they don't wear out as quickly right where we put them because we are cognizant of where the wheels are going on the street. If you think of a freshly fallen snow, you want to avoid painting in those, those tire marks because they'll start to wear in like six months where the rest of it lasts a year to three years, depending on, on how difficult the winters are. And I'm often asked about repainting. Um, it's really just a party. The, hard, the hardest part about this, this whole process is actually designing it and laying it out. Once you've done it, it's, it's really easy to repaint. And we've repainted a number of these. Next slide. This one's in Dorchester, and uh, it's a church community that did this next to a park, and they close the street and have church functions that, that extend the park into the street. Uh, next slide. This is Franklin Street and a, and a homage to Ben Franklin's kite experiment with lightning and kites. And uh, 
is right near a school, so there's just a ton of traffic. There's also a video associated with this one. I don't have the link, but if you email me, I'll be happy to send it to you. You can really see the kids going to school in our video. Uh, next slide. So this is the aerial of the first the first one I showed you, which um, you can see it from the top of a building, and it's just really beautiful. And hopefully, someday there'll be a fountain in the middle of the street. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's my whole presentation. And I'll turn it back over to Diane. Thank you, Mark. This was very inspirational, and I hope to see a lot more colorful streets in Massachusetts as a result of your work. I'd like to welcome back John, who's going to tell us about how we can plan our own Safe Routes to School Tactical Urbanism event. Welcome back, John. Thanks, Diane. So uh, by now, I'm sure you're really kind of thinking uh, creatively and getting inspired to kind of uh, implement your own tactical urbanism event. Uh, from the examples, you know, we you probably have some ideas of the steps involved. Um, these, the eight that are on the slide right now are kind of the ones uh, I've been a part of, and I'm going to summarize them in the uh, few minutes we have remaining. The first one is identify issues and opportunities. The first step is really determining uh, what issues you want to resolve through your demonstration project. So common ones are listed on the slide, but really it, they are about being context sensitive and each school will probably have their different and unique challenges to overcome. Uh, I'd also like to point out this is a really good time to collect that before data to document the issue. It could be how fast drivers are going, how many drivers are yielding to pedestrians, how many walkers and bikers are there, and I'll touch on evaluation um, at the end of this list. Also, you want to determine your, your project type. Once you've identified the issues, you can really start thinking critically about the best way to address it. There are a number of resources, resources out there to, re to help identify uh, effective project types that you may want to include. Um, one is uh, the NACDA Urban Street Design Guide. Uh, AARP even has a, a pop-up demonstration guide. Um, we will include these links to the resources in the, uh, the, in the presentation. Establishing a schedule uh, is very critical for any demonstration project. Weather, uh, while it seems to be um, spring is knocking on the door for most parts of the U.S., uh, it's really impossible to predict 100% accurately. You know, water um, and a lot of inclement weather may not mix well with temporary materials. The larger events really do take a longer time to plan, and um, really we've identified outreach is more, uh, much more critical for those type of events. Combining your event with walk to school is a great idea, um, giving better exposure to, uh, more, to more users. And um, take this opportunity to point out that uh, May 1st is Massachusetts Walk, Bike, and Roll to School Day. So uh, start thinking about demonstration projects. Although asking for forgiveness uh, rather than permission it seems to be a hot trend nowadays, um, I really recommend talking with your local police or public works department about your plans. It makes it may be a difficult conversation in the beginning, but very, very worthwhile in the long term. Um, particularly if there's parking being temporarily removed, uh, that will be a hot button issue and, and help controlling traffic while you set up the demonstration project. Um, also, if it's really, if your school is in more residential area, giving any neighborhoods a butters uh, head up is also a very good idea. Um, in the uh, Jeff Davis example, they really wanted to have adequate um, planning and time frame to kind of promote the event, uh, which led uh, the actual event from, uh, from planning to implementation took uh, over a month to kind of uh, to plan for and then implement just because they wanted to get buy-in and uh, to really get everyone on board with this, with this demonstration project. To be effective and create long-term change, tactical urbanism needs to be designed to function well, better, much better than existing conditions. Uh, it can take time and several revisions to get the idea right, uh, which is all part of the, 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 the planning and fund design process. Um, in Massachusetts, your Safe Routes to School Outreach Coordinator 
uh, can help assist with arrival and dismissal observations and um, also conducting a walk audit on the popular routes of school can really help generate um, a magnitude of ideas for, uh, for any event you're planning. Uh, this is the really the, the fun part, being creative. Um, you know, I've seen everything from pool noodles, pinwheels, used in tacti tactical urbanism events. The, the image shows a combination of city traffic cones, flowers, planters, um, all from an inexpensive uh, real retail store, and even some artistic use of uh, white duct, duct tape and powdered chalk to designate a creative crosswalk marking. Uh, many, of it, many materials are available on loan from uh, your local public works department or even school facilities department. Um, others like the ones from North Mitchell, we, we uh, procured at a uh, hardware store for, um, for low cost. Uh, for the for the materials. Similar to the schedule schedule of the event, uh, volunteers are needed and depend directly on the size of any demonstration project. If you're planning something large, be sure to recruit a few more volunteers than you think you need, just in case of uh, conflicts or no shows. Offer community service hours for students interested in helping out. Depending on the school that you may be working with, uh, really engaging and involving students in the design is a great way to bring uh, Safe Routes to School into the classroom and uh, provide students that hands-on uh, real-world experience. So, uh, you know, from start to finish, you really want to um, implement and evaluate. Uh, evaluation is one of the six E's as part of the Safe Routes to School. And, uh, I see it as a critical component of the tactical urbanism. Um, again, if the ultimate goal is change, you'll need, you'll be able, should be able to provide documentation on the improvement over the existing condition. Uh, there are basic two types of evaluation, qualitative and quantitative. For the qualitative evaluation, uh, you can ask people how they feel about the demonstration project. Was it easy to use? Did they feel safe? Should it be permanently, permanently installed? Um, you can ask these in person or via an online survey has been proven really effective. Uh, you can also capture feelings on the photos um, themselves during the event um, and then really ask participants to kind of write down their favorite parts um, during, uh, from the event. Quantitative data can include traffic counts, speed data. Uh, the photo here is from the large open streets event in Howard County. Uh, this is a Google image showing the traffic on the day of the event. One traveling will shut down each direction. However, what is not shown is the over 1,200 people that came out to experience biking and walking along the protected facilities. This is a much larger improvement of users than would be on a typical day. Um, all of that is to say what you measure sure does matter. And be sure to evaluate um, uh, the improvements in your demonstration project. Thank you for the time. I'll pass it back to Diane. Great, thank you, John. I just wanted to say thank you to all of our speakers. I think this was really great, and I, I can't wait to go into our schools and start talking to them about some uh, tactical urbanism events. I do want to let you know that we will, again, have the presentation available online. And to everyone who attended today, we will be sending out a link of all the resources. You'll see some of those on the next page. Also, when you exit WebEx, there will be a brief survey that I'd like you to take. If you have any questions about um, the Massachusetts Safe Routes to School program, you can visit our website. You can also send me an email. All of this, again, will be available on the resource uh, document that we send out. Here are some additional resources that our speakers mentioned, uh, the AARP pop-up demonstration and NACTO Urban Street Design, as well as a link to the video that Mark uh, discussed. Those will all be sent out. And now it looks like we have about five to 10 minutes or so for questions. Emily Bazinkowitz, who is our statewide lead for Safe Routes to School, has been diligently capturing all of your questions and we'll, uh, we'll start asking them and we'll see if we can get some of our speakers to, to answer them. So speakers hold tight, we will go to Q&A. Emily. Great. So the first question we have is, what are some strategies for implementing tactical urbanism on narrow rural roadways? So John or uh, Mark, who would, or, well, or Sarah, who, who would like to answer that? And make sure speakers, you are off mute, please. 
this is John. Um, yeah, so the, the two examples specifically in Georgia, um, I, can, I think kind of speak to this. Um, I think it's kind of looking um, and exploring ways that are um, essentially off the roadway. Uh, many times, I think in these rural conditions, there's not a lot of infrastructure to work with. So I think you'll need to be creative and um, really kind of think about the varying materials that may work, not necessarily on the roadway, or uh, a combination of um, uh, different, different kind of treatments as well to help uh, really kind of like sell the idea and uh, get uh, community buy-in, you know, and it doesn't have to be large scale. It could be as simple as uh, a little crosswalk or crosswalk that we did uh, connecting to a shared use path. Um, but generally the, uh, the, you want to convey the overall concept and uh, hopefully get buy-in from the community. Great. Okay, next question. So this question is for Mark. Um, Mark, can you discuss more about um, did the trees take up parking spaces and were there any roadblocks with the city um, with getting the trees in those parking spaces? Um, and also, what is your general process for getting tactical urbanism in the streets? So it's a bunch of different questions. Okay. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, yeah, we we actually haven't done a street tree yet. We are we're planning to do one in Everett this year and hoping to do one in Somerville next year. But I think the big things are connecting with public works to make sure that snow plowing is not impeded. Um, I think a, a thing that we're really wanting to find out is the health of the tree in terms of salting and getting a type of tree that will really withstand salt. I was on a road in Cambridge the other day and I saw a tree that was planted many years ago and had kind of encroached on the street on a very urban street. And I was thinking, well, here's a, here's a tree that survived many winters without any love and hardly any tree well and has actually grown into the street. So I know, I know it can happen and, and, it, and it worked in Providence, but it's something that I think um, we're, it's a work in progress and we're going to include as many stakeholders in the city as we can from the city arborist to DPW um, to make sure that the, the placement is good and that the tree survives. Great. Thank you, Mark. I, I, I know that especially living in a, a state that sees a lot of different weather and is certainly the salting and the snow and the snow plows, it's certainly something to consider. Next question, Emily. Great. So the next question says, maintenance and liability are major concerns of municipal public works departments. What is the best way to address these concerns when planning tactical interventions? For example, roots growing through sidewalks and other permitting issues. So it's probably for John. Probably John or Mark. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is John. Uh, I've been asked this. Um, pretty frequently, and I take the approach in discussing with Public Works or any kind of uh, local department that may have concerns about this, that it is only temporary. Um, you're not making any permanent changes, and it's only for a, a short duration commonly. So I think if you structure the, the conversation that way, um, it's been much more positive as opposed to uh, different approaches of maybe just um, being more direct or maybe not having the initial conversations about your de demonstration project up front. Um, but I think it's always, but it's, it's, it's a short term, short term uh, demonstration project with low cost materials to kind of study if, uh, if a design works or not. And if it doesn't, then go back to the drawing board and, and think about something else. Thanks, John. We have time for one more question, and this one, uh, I believe, is for Sarah. Yes, so Sarah, how did the parents at Woodland Academy react to this new setup, and did you warn them beforehand? Okay, um, this project was definitely not a secret and was talked about at PTO meetings, but I didn't make any big announcements beforehand about when I would implement and what I was exactly implementing. Um, so the goal was to reduce the driver's false sense of security and an increased unpredictability leads to slower and more careful driving and a lot of the traffic that was in the school zone during arrival and dismissal was 
parents. So I wanted to see how people naturally reacted to it, just observing how it went. Um, and I also think that people, when they see the value and they see for themselves that their neighbors or other people are interested in making change, I think it can really help win people over and smooth the process to new and safer infrastructure. Thank you, Sarah, wonderful advice. And I do want to thank everyone for attending. Please do follow up with us. Let us know if you enjoyed this or, or what future topics you'd like us to cover. And uh, please do fill out the survey at the end and look out for the email from us with all of the resources. We hope you have a wonderful week and we'll see you out at our schools. Thanks.